Right, well, good evening. Uh, thanks very much. I'm hoping you're not just going to listen. Do chip in, ask lots of questions, have lots of conversation. I think it's much the best way of doing things. And I'm afraid I've just literally put some stuff together on a slide set to start a, pod, a conversation, really. Um, so we'll go from there. There are sort of two things I want to end up talking about. But before that, I just want to talk a little bit about where we are going from Cambridge Consultants, because I think that sets the context a bit for the Internet of Things, where we think it's going, and some of the personal experiences I've had before I actually got to Cambridge Consultants. Um, so Cambridge Consultants, um, some of you may know, formed out of Cambridge University. Basically, some guys left university to set up the consultancy in the 1960s. Uh, it is now a sort of fairly large cons engineering consultancy, very, very focused on building and designing stuff for our clients. So that stuff is very physical. Uh, and my role, and I joined Cambridge Consultants about a year ago, is to, to take the physical and to connect it to the digital and provide the service. So while I do spend a lot of time thinking about databases and cloud-based systems and stuff, actually my personal focus is on what you do with the physical devices. It's the service element, and then you just how you implement that in, in digital services. So that's my connect, that's my sort of focus, and that's sort of some of my background that hopefully will come out over the next uh, couple of slides. So what do we mean by digital, um, the Internet of Things? Uh, well, we can think about typically quite large, complicated things mostly. That's where we started. Uh, in this case, it's a radio that we as a company have helped build. Uh, it's a fairly low-cost radio, but it's still probably about a $60 uh, retail price point. It's still fairly large, fairly clunky. It's connected to the Internet. It's about streaming. It's providing radio services to the Internet. Sort of where the Internet of Things sort of started uh, and where it's going. Uh, and actually, it's starting to, to get a bit more sophisticated than that now. So in this case, a very simple example of how we would connect a medical device. How do you connect a medical device to the in internet securely, safely and in every home without necessarily relying on a Wi-Fi box or 3G? Well, what we're seeing here is effectively a very simple hub that you connect your device to using either a Zigbee or a Bluetooth type connectivity uh, going forward. So this was done a couple of years ago and actually the world has moved on significantly in the last couple of years and particularly around Bluetooth low energy. Uh, it's, it's making quite a big change in where we're going. So you can see how the Internet of Things is starting at quite a big solving, solving big problems, probably quite high-end problems, probably quite sophisticated, and it's great to get someone like Cambridge Consults in to do a great job of doing, designing that kit and making maybe, for example, a medical piece of equipment work electronically and going through all those medical elements. But the world is moving on quite significantly, I think, from that. Um, and so one area is actually, well, how do you start to make things very simple? Well, the phone camera is astonishing in what it can do. It's connecting things to the internet that aren't electronic. In this case, it's a very simple uh, analyzer. So you, you either wee on the stick or you put some blood on the stick and you actually, you, 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 your, you do your assay, you do your medical assay or with, with chemicals on the paper. You work out where it's going. You take a photograph of that and that photograph becomes, connects the um, experiment or the analysis to the internet. It connects it, it identifies it to the patient, it identifies it to the particular date that that device was created or that paper was printed, was imprinted with the chemicals. It allows you to provide an awful lot of connected service. The device itself is just a piece of paper with some chemicals on it. So what are we connecting to the internet? And I think that's quite an interesting um, element in, in the story. Um, and then I think the Bluetooth low energy is starting, I think is completely changing the picture. So uh, a couple of years ago, we started building uh, what is effectively a, an experimental platform for us at Cambridge Consultants. Normally, we get our clients to spend money with us. We develop for them the best product we can. Occasionally, and, this, and like this one here, we do our own investment. And this is building something that's really, really simple. The device is a Bluetooth low energy device with a simple PCB, a small coin cell battery, and a small number of sensors, the sort of sensors you find on your phone. And actually, I've got one here, and it is connected to the, to the iPad. Um, very simple bit of kit. It's got accelerometers on there. It's got a, a humidity, temperature. We're currently putting one with a barometric sen uh, pressure sensor on that. You put that on a parcel. I know if someone, Royal Mail or whomever, has dropped that parcel en route. It's quite handy, really. Don't hey. to do uh, <laughs> so what's going to happen is I can put this, personally, I can put this in a parcel. I can ship it. Royal Mail, DHL, whomever, I'm not going to mention any names um, <laughs> because it is dangerous and there's lots of messes out there and there's lots of YouTube videos of people doing some nasty stuff out there. I could put this in my parcel and DHL do not know or uh, whomever don't know that I'm measuring what's going on with my parcel. 
But what's the unique cost on that? Well, that's the point. Yeah. I can do a, a sort of... It depends what you put on it, but a bill of materials, electronic components, I can probably get a million of these from China for less than $10, wow. including the battery and the casing. Do you get location data off that? Not this one, because what we've done is we've stripped everything out. But I get location data out of that. Now, I haven't bothered to try the Wi-Fi and the 3G isn't connected, but this little mechanism, as soon as it connects to here, it uses the iPad's location. And that gives me a, probably 100 feet. I've got a 100 foot range probably on this. And that's probably enough for most of the information. And so we are, we, we designed this a, a year or so ago. It came out of the idea one of our engineers received a teapot from John Lewis that was broken. He said, oh, we've got to solve this problem. And so the problem was solved. Now, this is actually an experimental platform. We're now putting this onto a windscreen of a car and we're working out how well you drive. Yeah. It's the same PCB. No change. The software has changed. That's all that's changed. So we can put this and we can measure the vibrations on the window of a car to work out what gear you're in. Because of the, we can hear the wheels go round. We can see the cylinders fire. We know whether you've clipped your winger. We know which of your doors have been opened and closed and whether your vehicle is moving at the time. Question, what if it's an automatic? Uh, again, we can, we can hear that. We can actually hear whether it's an automatic <coughs> or whether it's a manual. Okay. We can hear whether it's a diesel or whether it's a petrol. We can work out From the, the idling rate. Yeah, exactly. So we just simply measure the vibrations. Now that's quite interesting because if you think about telematics today, you're talking about putting a GPS GSM unit in the back of a car costing about 300 bucks to get it into your car. Well, I'm doing this with a 10 buck type solution. That's a completely different way of doing things. So what we've found is actually that the Internet of Things is changing. And there are going to be 50 billion things on the Internet by 2020, if you believe, whomever. Um, they ain't going to be GSM modems. They're going to be Bluetooth connected devices like this. They're going to be about $5, $10, $20, whatever you think it might be. And you won't pay for this. You'll pay for the service. You'll pay for the telematics. You'll pay for the service that's associated with the why you've got it. If you put it on a parcel, you get a premium service from the Royal Mail. You put it on a, on a drugs uh, delivery, you work out whether your drugs being shipped to Africa are within temperature profile, and a lot of drug compounds are vibration sensitive. So we can now make sure the drugs that go out to Africa are actually worthwhile. And I've, I'm, I'm reliably told that in parts of Africa, if you go under anaesthetic, they will put twice as much anaesthetic in you than they would normally in the West, because they don't trust the way that the anaesthetic has got there. So I'm, I just think, if we're able to do this sort of stuff, that, that device has not changed. And in fact, while I'm waving it around, it's currently connected to that, that uh, iPad. So, so what's, what's the battery life on it? Well, it completely depends on what you want to do with it. If it's constantly connected to a Bluetooth. If, if I'm streaming data off it at the Bluetooth rates, yeah. or if I a week or so, on a console, okay. Um, possibly a bit less, actually. I mean, it does depend on what you're trying to do with it. Um, if you put it in the car um, on a particular duty cycle where we're measuring when the car's going or not going, we are going to um, test right now, but we are planning around a year. So the idea is you ship one out with your insurance uh, documents, fits in the post, it's nice and thin, less than the 5mm Royal Mail uh, requirements, uh, and you throw it away at the end of the year. Um, I can't, can't quite figure it's got Bluetooth connectivity. You stick it on a parcel, the parcel's going all over the show. Yeah. It's not always going to be within range of any kind of Bluetooth connection. Correct. And even if it were in range of a Bluetooth connection, it's got to be able to connect to that Bluetooth connection. And maybe it would be barred from that. Correct. So how do you pick up the data? So there's lots and lots of different parts to this, to, to getting them the information back. Um, the, 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 the simplest one is that the people providing the service will have a Bluetooth device. And that's pretty much... Any iPhone, any iPad, uh, most top ends Android phones these days, it is now becoming completely standard. Uh, so anything that has a Bluetooth in it will become Bluetooth low energy over the next... Uh, so it would be like the parcel van yeah. has, has yeah. Bluetooth in his thing yeah. that he's taking from point to point. That, and, and also the consumer is likely to... If you're buying that service, you're sort of probably going to be able to buy yeah. that service. Right. And also, the other thing is, these can talk to each other. <coughs> I don't know if you've used Fireside Chats on your iPhone. That's a mesh network principle. Communication is direct between iPhone to iPhone. Well, it's direct between tank to tank. Sorry, what was that app called? Fireside. 
or is it via chat? I, saw, I can't remember exactly what it is, but one of the two. Do, do you not have to pair them too? So there are pairing issues, yes, but yeah. with Bluetooth Low Energy, it's all about making that easier. Okay. So, um, so basically what we're doing is providing an app on the various phones that connect to the device uh, and then takes the information off. Now, if we take the example of putting this on a drug packet of drugs in manufacture of the drugs, it then goes into a warehouse, it then gets shipped, it then goes into a clinic and stays in a fridge, and then it goes to a patient's home and goes, gets used in a fridge. I've got lots and lots of different users on that cycle. I don't actually want all of that data to be shared with everyone. So I've actually got to have a service profile that changes as it goes through those various different gates and states. And that's very important. So actually, a key part of this is the service that then delivers that information, shares that data. Um, and if I'm wearing it, for example, we're doing a, an internal demo um, where you wear this. Why, why do I wear that? Well, I wear that because actually it's a badge. I can talk to people. These two tags will talk to each other. We know we're having a conversation. I can use that. I can tap that, and it becomes a way of marking my diary, my day. It talks to my phone. It becomes really, really powerful, same bit of kit. But how do I handle security? How do I handle my identity? How do I share that information? All this is doing is asking questions the service tries to answer the question. So one of the big things I talk about in, in, in any sort of internet sort of things, conversation, look, technology is there, the, the electronics are there, the communications are there. That is not your issue right now. It's what do you want to do with it? Right. It's about throwing the device away up in the or throwing the, just changing the battery. Right. If you've got 50 million of these knocking around, how are we cycling? I do not advocate filling landfill with all these things. <coughs> However, business models are such that you can, if you want to, throw it away. So, yet, yeah, we have to, as part of European law, when we design this, we have to make it, um, you have to, consumer has to be able to take the battery out of any electronic kit. Well, you ask Apple that, but anyway, that is the idea, <laughs> um, in, in, in certainly in new, in new law. So, we're actually designing this as a battery replaceable service. So, while a proposition may last a year, if you replace the battery, it just keeps on going. And that, that, doesn't, that doesn't matter. To an extent. So we've skinned this down. Part of the reason we get this so cheap is we are using the Bluetooth chip from CSR, which was, as it happens, a spin-out from, uh, from, uh, from Cambridge Consultants. So we're sort of a part of the family. We are actually using that chip as our processor and our data storage, which is one of the reasons we get rid of a chip off the, off the PCB. Now, the amount of data you can store, well, we're not talking a megabyte, not even a megabyte. Now, actually, that, well, well, that's, you don't need much data. And there's a service I'm about to show you in a minute that it just shows you you can deliver lots of value with very little data. It's about taking an event, and one of the events we do is we can work out a car, whether a car has hit a curb. If you hit a curb as you go round, you shunt the, the back of the uh, car around as you go, go around the corner. We can measure that on here. Now what we do is we take all that raw acceleration data and we say, curb strike at this time, and that's a tiny piece of data, and we push it back at the time. So the amount of information you have is huge, but the amount of data you have is very small. Speaking about car, I wonder what are the benefits of the device because all the smartphones uh, have the accelerometer and the uh, gyroscope and there is a lot of software apparently in the market. That is true. Is However, if you, put a, if you put a phone uh, in the pocket of a large person or in a, in a car... Or a holder on the windshield. Uh, uh, okay, you can try that, but again, the holder on the windshield doesn't really give it to you. There's, there's too much um, disconnection between the measuring device, the sensor, and the vehicle. Uh, and also, if you are provided with a service, let's say you're an insurer providing <coughs> that service, I have no idea how my driver is connecting it to the, to the, um, to the car. Whereas if, they, if the insurance provider owns the sensor and owns how it's used, it becomes a much more controlled capability. And actually, it's all down to the algorithms and measurement. And the better the algorithms, the better the measurement, the, the fewer false positives you have, the better the service. So while at some point we may be able to interpret for a, a, basically a fat man sitting in a car, bouncing up and down, independent of the car, it's the unsprung mass basically is one of the big problems in the car, um, then actually that's, we, we could do that. So we also have separate technology where if you had the phone in a pocket, we know how you're walking, we know which direction you're going. And that's just a, a software on a phone. Well, we put software on one of these and we can do something similar. Um, but it's a case about where you're located. Sorry. Well, we, we, can, we can sense the process of removal. Uh, if it's sitting in a car, we sort of know it's in a car. If it's sitting in someone's back pocket, we know it's in someone's back pocket. Oh, so it, it's sort of, it's one of those things where it's secure because we can just measure stuff. 
we can measure. And one of the things that I love, this, love about this, and that's why I'm using it for particular internal demo about wearing it, it gives me context. And in the past, we've been talking about, we've been talking saying location. And location gives us seven. <coughs> context is far, far more powerful than location. And what's, what's going on? What am I using it for? That becomes quite a powerful proposition. And so you start to bring that up to the advertising world, and context is even more powerful than location in that process. Um, sorry, yes, we go. Uh, so what's the security model? Um, well, it basically it's a PKI chip on here, uh, and it's what you would like to overlay on top of that. So it becomes the key. So it becomes a cloud interaction. It actually is a three-tier architecture, which we try to sort of show here. You've got the device in the, in the um, car, you've got the phone, which is your middle tier, which is your, typically your hub, your way of getting information back, and then you've got your server. Now what we do is we end-to-end -end encrypt the packets of data. Some packets of data we actually don't end-to-end -end encrypt. We allow them to be interpreted part way, and we can then add further information from the phone, like GPS, for example. I can add to the phone, from the phone, to the packet of information. So designing the data path is vital, but if you want security, you absolutely need end-to-end -end encryption, and you do need a PKA-type implementation, and, and that supports it. What about on the bus? Uh, against safe attacks or data security on the phone? Um, yeah, so you're, you're now talking about the level of information that's available and the value of that information for the pain to actually do it. So, uh, yes, at the end of the day, these things can be broken, you will get data off, but we haven't got nude photos on here. <coughs> yeah, but if I can, Ultimately, you yeah. can modify your thermometer yeah. to say, I'm driving perfect all the time, and that makes my insurance premium. Um, yes, but I think that's, that is the, um, I mean, that's, that's a level of analysis that one, I'm not an expert to tell you the answer for, but actually that is something that we can become very quickly aware of through the whole security model. Because one of the things there is actually the firmware management. Firmware management determines the algorithms that determine what speed I'm in and how it's being used and so on. And that's all, obviously all part of the whole security end-to-end -end piece. So I mean, the beauty of this is that I mean, we'll have millions of these things out there. I mean, I would hope in a year's time that a good proportion of this room will have one of these in their car, actually. We're in that sort of position. Uh, well, again. <laughs> <laughs> you may not want it. You may not want. But as a as a dad, my okay, my kids are only twelve at the moment. But in a few years' time, I'm not going to be able to afford their insurance. I just won't. Um, so I'm going to need something like this to do. Maybe you said about a megabyte of data that it's far less. Uh, well, okay, a little bit less. What, what what's it what's it in? Is it NAND memory? What kind of memory? Uh, EEPROM. Oh right. And so you could get that. that So anyway, so that's that's that device. Um, I, there's actually it is a connected, very simple connected demo, but I'll, I won't do that now. Um, I also want to just, the second thing I want to talk about was just how far can the Internet of Things go, uh, and this relates to a project I've been involved with many years ago before I was involved with Cambridge Consultants. Um, so this is a solar panel, in the middle of an African village. Why isn't that part of the Internet of Things? Well, it is. Um, so. A few years ago, I helped build for Vodafone a thing called M-Pesa. M-Pesa is a mobile payment system. You use your mobile phone and SMS, just SMS, and it's encrypted over SMS, to be able to move money around. It's currently moving 43% of GDP in Kenya, and at least 20% of GDP in Tanzania, and it's, it's keeping on going. It's a, it's, a, it's a lovely, lovely service that's given access to people who don't have bank accounts, access to money. But what we always believed at the time, and now what is absolutely happening, is that this money transfer service is a platform. And it's a platform, in this case, for pay as you go solar. So what does that mean? It means that I can actually have a solar panel on my roof and a battery sitting in my house that allows me to turn a light on at night and charge my mobile phone. And I can pay for that as I need it. And so we put a SIM in the battery charger we actually allow you to send money from Impasa from your phone to your solar charger effectively, putting money on it, paying for it. So you pay for the service. You get this as a sort of higher purchase, which is the second part of the story actually, is that it's a, oh, sorry, um, so must have built it into here. It's a big data story because we analyze people's credit history by understanding how they interact on Impasa and move their money around. We analyze whether they're at appropriate risk and there's lots of other information that goes into that. And then we watch them use MCOPA, the um, solar charger. It becomes a really powerful solution. Now, I personally wasn't involved in MCOPA, but I'd love to have been, because I think it's a really fabulous uh, offering. And I, I know the guys are doing it, and I really believe what they're doing is fabulous. 
but it's, you see by giving someone access to a payments mechanism by a really simple technology, SMS, you can start to broaden your Internet of Things to a completely different approach. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite passionate about trying to just change the way we think about Internet of Things. It absolutely is much, much cheaper than we ever thought it was going to be, much easier, much lower value of entry, and it's much, much broader. It will affect far more people in the world. And actually it will bring much, much more impact to those further down the economic pyramid um, than we ever thought possible. So, uh, thank you. Happy to take more questions if yeah, that makes so sense. Yeah, so while um, Paul's getting set up, um, if anyone's <coughs> getting more questions, feel free. Yeah, uh, asking how you're finding engagement from big brands. Is there other in particular sectors? Is it retail, for example, health? So I, most of the work that we do is paid for by clients and we develop products for clients that they don't own. We're, we are engineering consultants in that way. Um, this actually is showing a glimpse of IP that we're bringing. So yes, DropTag is a platform that we use for experimentation and actually then we take further on and, and deliver as a business. But there is actually a service layer. So my, my role in, in, in Coach is all about digital services. So it's that service layer. So there is a, a piece of, of intellectual property software, if you like, that's where we allow the service to be configured. And actually, all of my know-how from M-Pesa um, is the identity, managing protocols identity, and delivering service, and I call it so much an identity to service path, that's in our core platform. Because I, I truly believe that's where things will start to really change. Uh, over and above the work that we're doing with our, with our clients. So do Cambridge consultants own the service side of things? Uh, are you running your own AWS followed up in the cloud? Is it your software running there? That, that sort of stuff. Um, uh, how much do you offload and how much do you do? We're, we're on a path, we're on a journey. So I have not been there that long. I have certainly not been there long enough to have built the software to own it all. Yeah. So we're on a path. So ultimately we will have a combination. So a lot of this will become a commodity over time. So there's lots of people out there who are providing services to connect things. No one is actually providing software services to provide the service of connected things. And that's our, that's our USP at the moment. You can see that changing. But we're bringing that to the party to allow people to focus on the thing and the service that they want to bring to market. And it means that, because a lot of very large software database services, they cost a lot of money just to get going because it's different every time apparently. Actually it's not. It's mostly very, very standard. If you get a, a federated identity to be able to log in, well, actually, everyone's got that, guys. Bring it in, standard module. So we can, we can absolutely reduce the cost of getting started. Then we can focus on what's unique about their proposition. And that's, that's, that's where we're going. That's the journey we're going. In that vein, how about the embedded side of things? Uh, you always want connectivity. You always want some kind of go-to-sleep and wake up to do things every now and again. Yeah. Like, do you have a standard platform that you tend to use? So, I mean, the, the, the drop to this is a platform for us. Uh, so it's a physical platform with some, with some uh, firmware thinking about it and some libraries that go on the various different phones, the various different operating systems. So that is our, that's part of the standard offering. Now, typically, every time we go and we do a, a different device, whether it be a sports wearable, uh, and we're working with various people and that sort of thing, then it's something similar, but it's not the same as this. A lot of the know-how and the thinking is in there, but there's, there's very little of the sort of the same exact IP. Most of that's down to know-how. I think that will change. I think as this becomes standardised, we will be able to sort of Lego brick or Minecraft brick the, um, the elements together to be able to do it. Um, yeah. You're going to be around afterwards, Tim? I will be, yes, absolutely. Great. Great. Thank you very All much. Right, thank you.